And so I drove by the governor's mansion on Saturday. There was an honest to goodness protest. This wasn't just a couple of people milling about. This issue has taken off, not just here, but nationally. Exactly. So where's this going? What's gonna happen? Well, you know, I have uh, attempted to get a, a meeting with the governor. Hopefully I can get a meeting with the governor. I understand the situation that he's in. You've gotta make certain we protect victims. Right. But also we've gotta make certain that we, before we um, provide the ultimate decision as it relates to a person's life and death, we've gotta right. make certain that no stone is left unturned. Th this case has been hanging around for a long time. I remember back in the days when I was the editor of Texas Monthly, we were talking right. about the Rodney Reed case and whether we needed to do a deep dive investigation on this case. Up to this point, now maybe it's when the execution date comes, people's minds tend to focus, right? That's exactly, why we're talking that's about That's exactly it. right. But up to this point, there has not been a successful effort to present the kind of evidence or the circumstances of the way the, the you know, some justice was, was handed down. There's not been a successful effort to date that would have demonstrated that Mr. Reed should not. And, and, he, yeah. and let me be real clear to the members of the audience and those yeah. that are on live stream. I have not poured, and I'm an attorney by profession. Right. I've not poured over the transcript. What I have done is read, read several stories, one of which was in the, in the Tribune. Yeah. Concerning some of the witnesses that um, have said that there should be some other considerations yeah. as it relates to who actually killed the victim in this particular case yeah. and evidence that has not been tested. Your view is if there's any doubt, why, if go, there's any why doubt, go forward? If, if, if there's any doubt, I would right. ask the governor and understand the considerations that he has taken place, right. taken into consideration, but I'd ask the governor to um, delay this execution yeah. so that there can be additional testing of evidence and also um, in terms of the credibility of some of these witnesses that are coming forth. Uh, you know, Junk, junk forensic science and, 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 and problems with the execution of, not, not to use the word execution in this context, but the way that uh, justice is dispensed. These are not new questions, not specifically only to Mr. Reed. That's we, exactly right. We have a larger conversation. Well, I have. mean, but the thing about it is also, yeah. if, if you have more advanced technology that can be utilized in order to analyze some of the evidence, let's utilize it. Why not evidence. use it? Why not use it? Back at the time that Mr. Reed was convicted, some of the technology available now to test evidence was not available. That's exactly right. And I'm not, you know, the, the fact is, is that we know that, that there's always quote unquote racial overtones here. Right. But the reality is, is that there is the possibility that there's evidence out there that needs to be tested to make right. a determination as to whether or not he was the person that committed this murder yeah. as we, or someone yeah, else. Yeah. As we move into the discussion of issues and, and, and this race, um, the Senate race, Criminal justice is something that we need at election time and at all times to be talking about. We have, well, we have yeah. a problem with this in this country and in this state? Oh, yes, we do. Yeah. I mean, the reality is Define that, it. Well, I mean, the, the fact is, is that uh, there is not the type of, uh, how should I say this, relationship, trust relationship between uh, the communities and law enforcement. Right. Okay? And uh, the fact is, is that if something happens in someone's neighborhood, first person, the first entity they will call in most instances uh, is the police department. Right. They want to make certain that when the police department comes, that the police department does their job. Yeah. Okay. And so, in, in terms of in the Senate, uh, over the years that I've been a senator, I've worked on these issues and continue to work on these issues. Yeah. When we look at body camera legislation, I was. Right. First, you've been involved with that. I mean, yeah. I was the one that sponsored the bill. Right. All right. Now you look at dash cameras. I was the one to put dash cameras in the laws and also made certain that there was uh, some sort of policy infrastructure that local um, units of government, police yeah. departments had to abide by. Yeah, when you talk about the pr problem with the relationship between communities and law enforcement, you extend that to the community of prosecutors. You ex extend that to not just uh, well, cops, uh, absolutely. but, but absolutely. DAs. Absolutely, right. and, and the fact is, and I was uh, disappointed, last session I tried to pass a bill, and we passed it out of the Senate on a right. bipartisan basis that did just the following, couldn't pass it out of the House, maybe they'll pass it out this time around. Uh, that basically said that law enforcement, all of us in Texas remember the Michael Morton Act and what right. happened there, that basically says this, law enforcement, when you send a case to the district attorney's office, you need to sign an affidavit saying that all of the evidence has been presented been turned to, over, right, been, yeah. been turned over. Right. And I wasn't able to get the House to pass that particular bill. Hopefully we'll be able to get that done. Well, there's a real criminal time. justice reform mentality, bipartisan in the House at the moment, right? There's a special committee in <laughs> well, don't I'm you gonna, think? I'm gonna leave that one alone. You don't think so? You think it's all for show? No, I don't think it's for show, but um, you know, that's House business. I'm gonna leave House business alone. You really want to leave House business alone? The Senate is so boring. <laughs> 
That's one perspective. Yeah. That is. <laughs> Spe speaking, speaking of the Senate being boring, you really want to trade Dan Patrick for Mitch McConnell? Uh, well, you know, here's the deal. I'm hoping that uh, Democrats are able to take the Senate. I know it's a long shot. Don't get me wrong. Well, you can do the math. Well, I can do the math. Right. right. There, there are seats in play. That, there's there's yeah. seats in play. And, and so, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell was that person who said they wanted Barack Obama to be a one-term president. He did. And did everything he could and has done everything he could do in order to kind of repeal the legacy yeah. of Barack Obama, and more specifically, like health care. Yeah. Why in the world in Texas that leads the country in the number of uninsured, would we not try to expand Medicaid, especially when the Affordable Care Act was passed, and we would have been able to get $10 billion a year right. from the federal government, with some, obviously, with some monies coming in from the state. But the present in problem that. in that case, uh, Mr. West, was not Mitch McConnell. The problem was Rick Perry. Take well, it up with Rick Perry. Well, no, the, the uh, problem was the tone that was set by Repu Republicans from the very top. At the national level. At the national level to do right. everything they could right. to stifle anything. That so you turned my question with. into an answer I didn't expect. So you don't uh -huh. want to trade Dan Patrick for Mitch McConnell. You want to trade Dan Patrick for Chuck Schumer or for whoever would be in that seat. I, w I want to make certain that I, we, quote, unquote, I don't want to trade, but the reality is we've got to get people there that will be able to work together to get things done. Yeah. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to run before. I realize that when you were on the ballot uh, that, that, that this time you have a, a quote unquote free shot, right? You're not on a ballot for the Senate this time, so it's a free shot. In 2012, when Ted Cruz was on the ballot against David Dewhurst and there was an opportunity to run for the Senate then, you were on the ballot. You did not have a free shot. That's when exactly John right. Cornyn ran in the past, there was an election, at least one of the elections in which Cornyn ran, you did not have a free shot. Is, the, is it the free shot that motivated you to run this time? You've been in the Senate for a very long time. You could have run before. Well, no, why now? Let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you why. Because when you begin to look at I'm a statistician also, okay? And when you begin to look at the numbers over the years, yep. you know, we always talk about this is the time, this is the time, this is the time. Well, this is the time. When you begin to look at the, do a trend analysis in terms of democratic performance over the years, you begin to see that the, the numbers are going in this direction. Yep. And obviously with Beto O'Rourke's performance during the last 2018 election, yep. we're, we're seeing that trend go forward. So you mean, by the numbers, you mean specifically Democrats getting their act together in terms of voter I'm, I'm, turnout? What I'm saying is it's not only uh, Democrats, but also you see independents and you see moderate Republicans coming together as a coalition. Yep. And that's what's happening in this state. If the when, I travel around yeah. this, when I travel around yeah. the state, yeah. I'm talking to Democrats, independents, and moderate Republicans. Some of the moderate Republicans don't want to come out right now. Okay, based on uh, their party being in, but they don't like what's going on. You think they're potentially persuadable in a general election? Absolutely. So you're running to be a candidate, not just of Democrats, but of everybody. No this one, sounds a lot well, like the Beto Senate race. Evan, here's the deal. Yeah. There's no way in the world that a Democrat running far left in the state of Texas will be successful. Anybody you have in mind specifically? In terms of what? Well, when you say Democrat running far left cannot be successful. Which, just, which I'm, far I'm, left Democrats are you talking what, about what I'm saying who would you, not be successful? What I'm saying to you is this. Yeah. A Democrat, any Democrat running far left yeah. cannot be successful. You he mean got, in the Senate race and the presidential race? Uh, yes. Both. Right. Yeah. And, and so in Texas, you've got to make certain you have someone that is center left, which I am, in terms of issues, and uh, uh, will be able to bring people together. The, the, the great thing about the experiences that I've had, yeah. I have been in the m minority party Ever since Ann Richards left, okay? Right. We haven't had a Democrat elected statewide in 20, That's exactly 25 right. years. And from that vantage point, right. I've been able to uh, cross the aisle in the Senate and also in the House and get things done. Yeah. And so I'll take that expertise, that experience to Washington. Yeah. So let me, I want to co come to your, your experience in the legislature in a second, but back to what you said about the statistics. So Beto O'Rourke got more than 4 million votes in the Senate race last time, the most votes any Democrat has ever received statewide in the history of Texas. The voter turnout in the 2018 election, a midterm election, which is supposed to be low, was actually at presidential level turnout. In fact, it was higher than the 2012 presidential turnout. Right. So had the voter turnout numbers in 2018 been more normal, had they been a normal midterm election, had those signs not been on the, uh, on the board, maybe you don't think about running this time. Ex ex exactly. But it was I mean, those signs specifically that said maybe but, there's But a not shot only now. those signs, but doing yeah. the trend analysis in terms of the performance of Democrats right. in the state. Yeah. So, so that was part that was part right. of the uh, calculus yeah. and the other part was my wife Carol. She said I could do it. So 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 she finally gave you She finally gave she me said permission. grace over it, right? right? Okay. Instead of La Ladies, I want to let you know that I run my house, okay? <laughs>
I run the vacuum cleaner, the yeah. dishwasher, and all those things. So instead of buying some fancy new car, you decided to run for the Senate. That was the trade you made. No. <laughs> no, not at all. You know, uh, I mean, a, a public service is the, yeah. the one. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the fact that you'd work across the aisle as one of the things that would recommend you to the voters in this race. What else in the time that you've, again, 26 years, elected 90, uh, you entered the Senate in 93, right? Right, exactly. So in those 26 plus years, what work specifically did you do in the Senate that would recommend you to us as experienced enough, qualified enough for this job? Let me start off with uh, issues of health care, yeah. which are very important. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is I tried to persuade the um, uh, then governor of the state of Texas looking at the numbers here in terms of the number of uninsured persons that we have in the Texas to take that money right. from the federal government. I also said, well, the, the, and one of the arguments that was, was being made is that, well, if the federal government, the federal government didn't have the money in order to do it. Well, the other states have been taking it. Right. And, and then both uh, blue states and red states, blue and red states, right. Kentucky. Okay. And so, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, yeah. hopefully. Uh, the fact is, is that he decided not to do that. And as a result, every legislative session now, we have to do a supplemental appropriation bill in order to fund, in part, Medicaid, right? And so when you look at my work in Health and Human Services, you'll see that I've been out front. Let's talk there for one second. In terms of women's rights, women should be able to make their own choices concerning health care. All of us remember exactly when we had that a battle on the floor where Wendy Davis um, uh, did the filibuster. And yes. it, was over, it was over women's rights. I was there. I was there working the floor, in fact, with Kirk Watson, who's endorsed me, uh, also to make certain that the Republicans didn't, um, and they, but they did, that we, we held their feet to the fire. And on that night, when you had thousands of people in the gallery, in the halls of the Texas State uh, Capitol, and outside the doors, you were there. In fact, you, te you guys, that was... Your coming out party, wasn't it? Well, we, we, no, live, that, that was, we, live, we live streamed the filibuster, yeah. but we'd also been live streaming non filibusters. Yeah, but, the, been, but that, but that, we just, but as, I, as I recall it, though, yeah. that was one of your highest rating live streams. Well, stream. it was a big moment, yeah. Right. right. But not only the Texas Tribune, but also for the citizens in the state of right. Texas. So your work and, on that night well, well, is support me, of me, the let filibuster. Let me finish, yeah, right, let yeah. me finish. In, in terms of issues concerning women's health care. Yeah. I've been there. When you begin, begin to look at issues concerning education, I have been there and I've been very involved. This last legislative session, by far, the most transformational education bill in, since, in, since the mid-50s. Yeah. I, I was involved in that. Higher education. I've been involved in higher education. Student financial services, trying to get the latest textbooks for students to reduce that cost. Building, uh, being on the front in terms of building universities, in terms of research issues. In the Dallas, North Central Texas area, I, w I led the charge in terms of building the University of North Texas at Dallas, which now has over 4,000 students and also the yep. law school up there. When you begin to look at issues of criminal justice, I've led the charge in terms of body cameras, hate crimes, getting vests for police officers so they would be protected against some of these high-powered bullets in right. terms of issues concerning uh, gun sense. You can kind of look at my history and see that I was the person working with Ann Richards back in the, in 93 to pass, number one, a background check bill uh, uh, to uh, ban assault weapons and reduce uh, the uh, magazine capacities. I started that work back then and have been involved in it. So yeah. do you want me to go on? No, no, but I think, I think you make a case that you're running on issues and you're running on experience, which is interesting for a couple reasons. First of all, you could argue that the O'Rourke campaign for Senate last time was not so much a campaign about issues, it was a campaign about aspiration and inspiration. He took a different path. He went to places where Democrats typically don't campaign. And he also didn't really make this a liberal versus conservative deal or a Democrat versus Republican deal because it's still a pretty conservative state, although it may be changing. Right. And he managed to run the closest U.S. Senate race since 1978 when John Hill was elected. You seem to be heading in a different direction. You're running more of a down the middle, I'm going to do. Uh, dem I'm going to talk about issues I'm, and w whatever the politics of the state are, if they're changing or not. I'm going to run. I'm going to hug these issues. No, no, no hold, hold, hold. Let, let me make sure I characterize it correctly. Yeah. I'm running a practical campaign in order to get elected and represent the core values of the state of Texas. Yeah, but you're not it's shying away from what are traditional. I'm not hearing a single position politically that is out of sync with your party. Not at all. Right. Not at all. I mean, you know, in terms of if, if someone were to ask me, 
in terms of issues concerning um, marijuana, as an example. Yeah. I'd be supportive of passing a bill to legalize marijuana. Right. I'd be supportive. Is there any issue on which you feel like you disagree with the Democratic Party? Is it, can you tell me one? I can't. I can't. One place where you part ways with the party? You know, I, I, not off the top of my head, but you know, sometimes when those things come up, right. you got to figure out. Well, are you, as it relates to a particular issue, what, where you are on that particular issue? I can't think of anything yeah. off the top. of But my head. you said that you thought that moderate Republicans could conceivably be persuadable in the fall. Absolutely. What, where did they agree with you? If, Edu if, education. Right. Uh, education. Uh, criminal justice. Right. Okay. <laughs> Economic yeah. development. Those Look, issues. So the, the Democratic primary, which as I've characterized, is crowded, is not a referendum, it's a choice, right? They're not voting Royce versus not Royce. They're voting Royce as opposed to one of the other people in the race. Why are you the better candidate versus those people? So talk to Democrats right now and say, in a race in which you've got Chris Bell and MJ Hager and Christina Sinson, Amanda Edwards and a bunch of other folks running in that race, why are you the best Democrat in that race? Well, in, in terms of making a decision to run, for the U.S. Senate. This is what was taken into consideration. Number one, I had to have a conversation with God, okay? You know that two or three o'clock in the morning call or, or conversation sometime you have with God. I had that conversation. I wanted to make certain that I wasn't doing it because of ego, and I got the thumbs up on that. Yeah. Secondly, what I ended up doing was talking to my colleagues to figure out whether or not I had, what type of support I had. And so I went to all of the senators all of the Democratic senators, and ask them for their support. Yeah. Of the 12 Democratic senators, I have the support of 10, actually 11, okay? And, and, Who's the holdout? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you could just say, say the word. Does it rhyme and, with and Eddie Lucio? Can, can, can I finish? <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. All right. And so, and so <laughs> I checked with the Democratic caucus in the Senate, and frankly, all 12 will be supportive. I have 10, including myself, that will be or have been uh, up front and will publicly endorse me, okay? Then I went to the House of Representatives, and there's 67 Democrats in the House. Of the 67 Democrats, I have the support of 49 of the Democrats. And so that told me that I had the support of my colleagues, and there's a whole, there's a, uh, congresspersons, sure. uh, commissioners, that also support. Well, what's, so the, I have what, the, yeah, what's the importance, Mr. West, of having all those endorsements? Well, 49 I, House members and 10 senators can, can sounds I, to me like 59 votes. Can I, can That's I, it. Can I finish? Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. And I was going to get to that. Okay. Let me get yeah. to it now. Okay. When you begin to look at those persons, and, and then the last person that I had to make certain was on my side was my wife, Carol. Right. And so we made that decision. And, been, and, and then we, when we sit down and visit about it, we looked at each one of the senators, each one of the senators, to answer your question represent about 850,000 people, somewhere off in there, right? Yeah. And you look at the House members in terms of who they represent. And to the extent that I, I recognize that some of the senators have been elected over and over and over again, there's a constituency. And as long as I can get those representatives and senators to help me to introduce me to their constituents. In their districts. In their districts, right. So you think that's, help me out. That, that's the significance of it. Right. Um, you will support whoever the nominee of the party. You that's plan right. to be the nominee of the party, but anybody in the race, if they end up being the Democratic nominee, there's nobody you could not support for Senate. Correct. Okay. Um, let's assume you uh, you hear in the next little while that Beto O'Rourke, having gotten out of the presidential race, uh, either does polling or others do polling for Mr. O'Rourke, and he makes a decision to get in this race. Does I'd that be, affect be, your I, calculus at all? No, it would, I'd be disappointed because one of the things that I did before getting into the race was to talk to Beto and ask him, not once but twice, if he decided to get out of the race, president would he get, race, yeah. would he get in? And he said no. Right, but things change. He also said he wasn't going to run for president. Things change. He gets in the race, he'll disappoint you, but will it affect your calculus at all? No. You stay in the race, absolutely. Full, full speed ahead. Assuming you win the nomination, Mr. West, are you running against John Cornyn or Donald Trump? Both. Okay. Explain on the Trump front what you're running against. Well, I'm I'm, I'm running against the most divisive president that I've um, witnessed in the history of this country. Uh, I've never seen America so divided. When you begin to look at our institutions, specifically our governmental institutions, they're divided. Yeah. When you begin to listen to the rhetoric and uh, how the this president has 
kind of undermine the demeanor of the White House. I'm very disappointed, and most Americans are disappointed. I'm disappointed in, in John Corning, who the first day that I announced my intentions to run for the U.S. Senate decided to put out an ad against me saying that I was one of the most liberal people in the race. Well, it wasn't too liberal when he asked me to help him pass bills as, a, as Attorney General, okay? But all of a sudden, I'm liberal now. And so, in the point with John, John has been kind of lockstep with the president on a whole host of issues that I think that don't represent the values of Texas. So, so you will try to tie you don't really have no, to work very hard I, to no, do it. I, I, will, I will tie. You will tie John Corn into Donald people Trump. Need to, people need to understand right. that I am, I am very diplomatic and I will continue to be diplomatic, but I'm not afraid to fight, okay? And yeah. I will fight for the values of Texas. I want to come to specifically what Cornyn has done in office in a second, but let me ask you, since the impeachment hearings are 40 minutes away from beginning, your point of view on the impeachment hearings, I believe, and on the process of impeachment, the inquiry has been pretty clear. You've said that you believe that the president's conduct is treasonous. You said you believe the impeachment inquiry is overdue, right? Well, if, uh, you support what's going on today and the process going forward. Yes, I do. Yeah. Have you made up your mind about the president's culpability here, about what should happen? No, I have not. I think that if, if, I, were, if I was in the Senate today, yeah. okay, it would be improper for me to sit up and say that I believe X, Y, and Z should occur without hearing all the evidence. So when John Cornyn says, I don't want to comment on this stuff because I'm potentially going to be a juror I, I agree in this, with, you I agree, agree with that. I agree with that. But, but you've said you believe the president's conduct is treasonous. You're obviously basing that on something. What more do you have to hear? I, basically what I've said is, is that when you look at the evidence, it appears to be that way. Right, but you're not... You're reserving judgment until you see how all this uh, right. how all this plays out. I, so, I put it, yeah. I put it in, let me put it in this context. Yeah. When you begin to look at the when you look at the news and you kind of use the analogy of a, a grand jury, yeah. I believe there's probable cause to suspect that he's engaged in the conduct. Right. But you don't make a decision based on probable cause. Until you hear the evidence. Until you hear the evidence. So you're gonna keep an open mind on this. Yes. Right. Um, so you're running against John Corden and you're running against an incumbent member of the Senate. Whenever you run against an incumbent, basically that incumbent uh, seeking re-election is asking to be rehired. As the challenger, you're suggesting that the people who hired him should fire him. What has John Cornyn done in the last three terms that qualifies as a fireable offense? Uh, you know, uh, what I'm gonna do is to offer Texans a choice, okay? Um, I'm gonna offer them a choice in terms of women's rights. Where's John been on women's rights to make a choice in terms of their health care? When you begin to look at health care, uh, where's he been on trying to fix the Affordable Care Act as opposed to kick it out in terms of uh, pre-existing conditions? Yeah. Uh, he's had the opportunity to uh, be in a leadership role but hasn't taken the opportunity to be in that role in order to come up with some creative ideas as it relates to how we fix the Affordable Care Act. And yet the They're public has elected him, though, pretty, well, sig pretty well, by significant margins and, over and, three terms. Okay, and that's fine. Uh, again, I believe that this is a different time frame. That's the difference. He's not different. The time is different. Well, I mean, again, you got to look at his record and, you know, do a comparative analysis to determine whether what he's done is represents the um, uh, values of the state of Texas. Is there anything he's done that you agree with? Uh, I bet you I could probably look at his record and figure out some things. But there's nothing that comes to mind. I mean, again, if this is, if, if and I asked this actually related to something you said earlier, that we're at a time in this country where people want government to bring us together. We're at a polarized moment. So in the spirit of wanting to think across aisles and bringing people together, I'm asking if there's anything about Cornyn to say that's positive. Do you have anything about Cornyn's record to say that's positive? At this point, I, I have not looked at his entire record, but I'm pretty certain there's something there. Right. So you're running against a guy See, who you're does. certain needs to be fired, but you can't cite specifically, having not looked at his record, something where you might say, I maybe agree with him on this. Well, you, you've got to understand this, is that when John Corning is from Texas, yeah. John Corning served as the Attorney General of the state of Texas. He did. I worked with John Corning on, on, uh, uh, on um, issues concerning child support. Right. Okay. You agreed and, more with that, and so, John. And so, and so the, the reality is, I, I bet you there may very well be something in his in his record. Yep. When I look at it to uh, determine uh, the pros and cons of it. But nothing you can call to mind. No, nothing I can call to mind at this point. Right. If you were elected to the one of the concerns that some Democrats have had about Corner is that he's a rubber stamp for this president. You may have a Democratic president elected in 2020. Why should we not believe that you would be? 
the same rubber stamp for that Democratic I'm not president. Trying, I'm, not, I'm, trying, I'm not going to try to stay there for three and four terms. I'm going to go up there and represent the values of Texas. Are you self-term limiting when you go in? Are you, are you saying that yes. Congressman O'Rourke said when he ran, if, for instance, against Sylvester Reyes, if I get elected to Congress, I'll only serve four terms. How many terms are you limiting yourself to? Two. So you are self-term limiting at two terms. If you exactly. get elected, it's two and out. That's it. Two and out. Right. And, and because you're self-term limiting, you feel like you have more of an opportunity to do what's right for the state. More independence. Without political considerations. Right. right. Um, let's talk about some of these issues, some of which you've already brought up. So on health care, uh, Senator West, where you have had a record in the, in, the, in the Senate, you have said you believe fundamentally that Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, has been a good thing. And you believe that if there are changes to be made, we should make changes. But you say specifically, and this is called out on your website, without forcing others to forfeit their employer-sponsored insurance. Right. So you are in the camp of those Democrats who, unlike some, who say, let's throw the entire thing out. You're not for Medicare for all in that sense. You're for modifications to the existing system, but don't force people to give up their private insurance if they want it. Here's, here is a, answer your question, yes. Yes. And, and this is what I've learned, this is experience. Right. I don't know of a piece of legislation that we've passed in the state of Texas yeah. that we can't revisit and make it better. Right. Okay? And that's the same thing in Congress. There's not a, a piece of legislation that's been passed by Congress that can't be revisited in order to make it better. Yeah. And so I think that that's what we need to be doing as it relates to the Affordable Care Act. But, and yeah. that's what I meant yeah. when I said, I'm said when Mitch McConnell said that uh, President Obama was going to be a one-term president and John Corning working with him in order to try to do that. Instead of trying to fix the Affordable Care Act, Republicans have historically tried to do away with it. There's, there's what, two cases right now in the federal courts trying to do, do away with "Quote unquote," Obama. Well, Texas, in fact, in the courts, is trying to be the lead actor. And that's exactly right. right, And so the reality is, is that instead of trying to fix it, they're trying to do away with it. But you understand, Senator West, that by saying we want to fix the health care system in this country, but we don't want people to have to forfeit their private insurance, that actually puts you on the other side of the momentum in the party at the moment. The momentum in the party at the moment is blow the whole damn thing up. Well, I'm not there. And the people in the, in the presidential field who are saying we should allow people to retain their private insurance are being routinely criticized by the, by the base of the party for saying so. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, yeah. the reality is, is that... Um, that's can you win a primary well, in this let, Democratic let me, Party can, defending can, can private I, insurance? Can I, can, I, can I finish? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, you know how this goes. I know how it goes. You, yeah. you know how I go, too. All right. You can interrupt me at your event. How about that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, I believe that people should have the right yeah. to be able to have private insurance. And we should be able to make certain that health care is a fundamental right, fundamental right for all Americans without having to do away with a person's right to have their private insurance. Yeah. So when unions, as an example, negotiate contracts, and health care is a part of that, should we do away with those rights? Well, that's been one of the criticisms of, the, of, of some of the plans being floated at the presidential level is unions are concerned because they've negotiated all these deals right. that would then be undone if you suddenly blow up the system. And I just gave you that as In an example. exchange for, they sort of did it as part of their comp, right? If you blow up the insurance part, then suddenly it's almost like a pay cut for them, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you're more in the Buttigieg camp of Medicare for those who want it, but not Medicare for everybody. I'm in Royce West's camp. You're, I mean, the, you're, I mean, you're not going to tie yourself to you know, I'm not, Right, exactly. Okay, the, the reality right. is, is yeah. that I think that's what the majority of Texas right. We'll come back to, to the presidential here in all a right. second. Okay. Gun, guns, you cited your work going all the way back to Ann Richards. You are unapologetic about your point of view on guns. You're for universal background checks. You're for banning assault weapons. You're for red flag laws. You're for limiting magazine capacity. And, and making sure that we maintain the, the intent right. of the Second Amendment. You live in a Second Amendment state. So where? So that's exactly where I was heading with this. How do you thread that needle in a state where people hear ban assault weapons, mag magazine capacity, background checks, red flag have laws, you, and they you think, looked? you're coming to confiscate my guns like Beto. No, no, no. I, I didn't say anything about confiscating guns. So right. So, okay, okay, so where's no. hit, hit the strip no. between the two. Okay. Have you looked at uh, what's going on? in suburban America in terms of issues concerning guns. Yeah. All right? And I think that my attitude, my position on these guns is consistent now with suburban communities and also urban communities in terms of the areas that you mentioned. <coughs> right. Banning assault weapons. You know, the Supreme Court, what, yesterday, 
just allowed a suit to go forward on uh, Sandy uh, Hook. Against the gun makers, right? Against the gun makers. Yeah. Yeah. And we had Coat decide to do what? Stop manufacturing assault weapons. So we're getting there in America. And retailers are actually starting to That's not exactly carry right. assault weapons. That's exactly right. right. And so from advantage point, I have been there, but I'm, I'm glad to see that given all of the horrific right. um, incidents that we've seen in America, that we now have more and more people here in Texas also right. agreeing that we need to do well, something. Well, let's acknowledge the disconnect. You know, the latest University of Texas, Texas Tribune polling showed that the public is for restrictions on access to guns, on limitations, even if it's a Second Amendment state. And I'm always interested in, on the one hand, where the public is, and on the other hand, where the leadership of the state is. There does seem to be a disconnect. Well, you know, my friend, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, came out right after, I believe, the, the shooting, the, the, the violence down in um, El Paso. Yes. And said that he was for background checks, but I hadn't heard anything. Like he that. said he was for back for st background checks on on private sales. On I private believe. sales. It was a specific. Yeah. It was a right. specific. Right. But it was also Lieutenant Governor Patrick who has been uh, uh, opposed closed, to red flag he is, laws. He's, clo he's, he's closed. He's closed the conversation. Closed the conversation on, on red right, flag So that laws. may very well be. Right. So you travel to East Texas. You travel to rural parts of Texas. I've and been. To you, I just got back from Fredericksburg. And you say. Ban on assault weapons, background check, blah blah blah. This is you're you're unapologetic about that, no matter right. where you campaign in the state. Exactly. Yeah, um, Senator West, you have called for free college, community college specifically for low income students. This right. is another bauble on the charm bracelet of 2020, free college. Now already we have free college for low income students at the University of Texas and at Texas A&M at different levels. I think 65,000 and right. 60,000 respectively right. below there. Mm -hmm. So how do you pay for free college? I remember Amy Klobuchar at the beginning of the presidential race up in New Hampshire booed by some Democrats for saying, we can't just walk into a room and say that we're gonna give everything away for free. There's gotta be a reality check on what we can afford to pay for. So let me ask you, as much as you may be for free college in certain cases, how do you fund that? Well, you, I want you to look at the Dallas Promise model that's now being replicated across the state. Yep. And what's happening is that local um, community colleges, colleges are going out to visit with um, philanthropists in order to help fund that particular project. So that's how you pay for it? Yeah. It's, pri it's private funding, not no, public No, it's, it's a combination. Yeah. It's a combination. Right. And then the other thing, that the other, when you begin to look at what we did in HB3, FAFSA, okay? The FAFSA forms, which basically, a FAFSA form is where you have students fill a form out to see whether or not how much money qualify for, qualify for financial, financial aid. Financial aid. And, and instead of making it a, what we did is said that you must fill the form out, and the only way that you don't fill the form out is that you opt out. You see what we're saying? Yeah. You opt out of filling the form. So that helps us also to determine exactly what monies are available that students would be right. able to access to f through financial aid. You understand the problems. I mean, again, you, you've been at the center of every higher ed debate in Texas for a very long time. Thank you for acknowledging You un But you understand, because you've been the center of those debates, the challenge that higher ed has. We spent a lot of time in the last session talking about how the state had started to insufficiently fund public education over the years to the point that we had to rebalance the seesaw. The fact is the state has largely gotten out of the business of funding higher ed as well. We don't talk about that as much, and it's pushed the cost of higher ed off onto the backs of families and students to the point that we legitimately have a concern about the affordability of higher education. Okay, that's a true statement. We cannot afford to fund higher ed in Texas. How can we afford at the national level to offer free college to anybody? Where is the money going to come from? We can't rely on philanthropists only. So well, where's the money going to come from? Well, it's going to end up having to come from community colleges and uh, in terms of those community colleges yeah. that want to do it, and also philanthropists. That's what's going to have to come. And the federal government yeah. is going to have to step in to the extent that we can. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't think we can fund everything at the federal level. We're going to have to make priorities. And so the question is, is whether higher education is going to be a priority or health care, okay? And then make certain that we do it in a, in a, in a manner that's, uh, yeah. uh, that's prudent. Yeah. Do you, okay. think, you think that the tax cuts that the president no. uh, uh, introduced and passed no have been a negative thing for this yes. country. Yes. Right. So you would you would come in as Senator West from Texas and you would vote to undo that tax cut? I would vote to, I would look at, and I have not looked at each one of the particular tax cuts. I wouldn't just say universal. I would come in and undo all of them. I'd be very judicious in looking at them to make a determination as to which ones benefit all 
Americans as opposed to a particular class of Americans. Right, so you are sympathetic to the argument that tax cuts that were offered to people of significant means should go away, that we should tax people on the basis of their high net worth or wealth I, I to fund some of these programs. I think that we need to tax people based on the needs of this country, okay? And to the extent that persons of higher wealth can be uh, involved in the, the taxing in order to make certain that we uh, uh, deal with issues here in this country, I think we should. But just because a person is high net worth, we shouldn't just say that you automatically have to pay, you know, 20% of your taxes on that. Let me finish. Yeah. Let me finish. We've got to look at what the issues are in this country and then determine exactly what's the most prudent way in order to finance what needs to be done. And to the extent that we need to tax persons to do that in the upper echelon, then we do that. How do you define rich for purposes of this conversation? Um, in terms of rich, I would say persons in the top one, one percent. Right. So, so you're not saying universally that we should just be taxing them for no specific reason at a higher no. level, but you, but you're open to the idea of increasing taxes. I, I think on I, I think that would be asinine to do that. Right. I mean, the reality but aren't is some we, people we, running we, for president well, and that's fine. about doing that? And they have they have they have the right to have that position. That's but you think it's asinine? I, I, yes, I do. Yeah. Because the reality is is that we have a system where we tell kids to go to school in order to be productive. That we, they get out, they 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 turn around and they try to get an education and to go about being productive in terms of uh, citizens, of workers, and also employers. And so to take away that type of incentive or that type of model to some of our kids who want to do that, I yeah. think is wrong. Yeah. And so to the extent that we have a tax system that says that just because you're in the top 1%, you've got to be taxed X dollars without a justifiable reason to do it, I don't think we should do it. Are there other taxes beyond simply a wealth tax that you would be open to as a United States Senator? You understand that what Republicans love to do the most at election time is to label Democratic candidates for any office tax and spend liberals. So give them the ammunition here, Senator. Tell them what taxes you're willing to raise. You know, I have not looked at all the different taxes. I think the persons need to look at my record here in the state Senate and get, kind of get a good idea in terms of what types of type of policies yeah. I, I uh, would be supportive. Hey, you, you've been open that. to tax increases in Texas during your time in the legislature, haven't you? Uh, some, yes. Yeah. Did you vote against the proposition that uh, uh, put the bullet in the head of the corpse on the income tax? Yes, did I you, did. Do you support it or do you oppose it? Well, I, I voted for it. You voted for Prop 4? Yeah, but after the change was made in terms of the definition, yeah. uh, in terms of what individual and natural person. My issue was uh, when the bill was passed, it had a provision in there that said individual. An individual could also be uh, interpreted, and legally it had been interpreted, as uh, corporations. Right. Okay? And But that was changed through legislation to natural persons. And so I was supportive of it. If Texans don't want a state income tax, then we shouldn't have a state income tax. But do, do, do you personally think we should have a state income tax? No. Because? Because if, if the majority of Texans, you have to have a defined... Well, I didn't ask them what they want. Well, I asked them what well, you want. Let me, do you think we should have one? Can I, can I answer your question? Sure, but Thank they're going to define much. it in terms of other people. I wouldn't okay, get to tell right, them anything. Right, okay. Yeah. Right, I'm getting ready to do that. Okay. You chance, right. When you begin to look at the sources of revenue in the state, and I have had the opportunity to be on the Finance Committee right. for... Uh, a lot of years. Long time. Long time. And so if we want to have defined sources of revenue in the state in order to do our budget, that's what we ought to do. I'm not for overburdening Texans as it relates to income taxes. I'm just not. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about, you mentioned w uh, women's uh, health and reproductive uh, health. You've been an unapologetic supporter of reproductive rights for women. Would that be a litmus test vote for you for the Supreme Court? One of the things that you'll do if you get elected to the United States Senate is vote on Supreme Court justices. There's always a talk of if litmus Supreme tests Court, at that Supreme time. Court, I, I, when I'm sitting down visiting with one of the nominees, I'll, I'll be asking them about that. I'll be reviewing their record because normally you end up having persons that have records sure. in terms of issues. And so I'll be looking at their issues. We and if, you have, if, I, if someone comes in and they have voted against women's rights, they wouldn't get my support. What if they say, I don't want to tell you my point of view on this because I don't want to prejudge a case that might come before me on the bench? Well, the reality is, is that most of them will have records. Right. Yeah? 
and and the and the reality is, if you have someone that comes in yep. and say that they're against a woman's right to choose, I'm, I'll be against it. Would you have been a yes vote or a no vote for Brett Kavanaugh? I'd been a no vote. Would you have been a yes vote or a no vote for Neil Gorsuch? I'd, I would have been a no vote. Yeah. What 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 in Mr. Kavanaugh or Mr. Gorsuch's record gave you the reason to say gave you a reason to say that you would have not supported them? A couple of things. I'm assuming it's just it's not a party line deal. It's just more on the substance. Philosophical. Yeah. Uh, when you begin to look at and, and, and I get both of them mixed up sometimes. Gorsuch was the last. Not uh, Kavanaugh was. The Kavanaugh last. was the last. One. I, I I had I had serious concerns about his conduct. Okay? Yeah. I had serious concerns about that. Um, Gorsuch, I believe, and I, it's been a while. I think that there were some issues concerning women's rights in terms of courses. Right. Uh, is Russia our enemy? Yes. Senator West? Who else is our enemy? Well, any... Uh, okay. This, uh, is a, this is something that actually this, your Senate experience doesn't help you with because you don't have a lot of foreign policy experience in the Texas Senate, maybe well, a little the, bit with the, Mexico. Well, the president doesn't either, but that's a different story. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, any dictatorship... Any yeah. dictatorship. I, I think North, North Korea is, a, is an enemy. Yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, we've got to deal with Russia as an enemy. Uh, China has been, uh, is a world power. I wouldn't class put them in the quote unquote enemy category, but I know this it's a country that we need to watch out for. Yeah, you believe that the president has been insufficient. You know, the president says all the time, no one's ever been tougher on Russia than I have. You believe that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Not at all. I think, I think the president emulates, wants to emulate uh, uh, Putin, to be honest with you. Yeah. When you begin to kind of think about uh, some of the things that uh, have been done, uh, you know, it, it's, it, when you think about private meetings where historically there are interpreters in there and there's a record of the meetings and the president says, no, I don't want you in this meeting, yeah. uh, that, that, that concerns me in terms of issues of transparency. There was a report that um, in terms of Ukraine, that the president didn't change his position on Ukraine until after he had a meeting with uh, Putin. And so those things concern me as a, would concern me as a U.S. Senator. And yeah. you're right, I have not had quote unquote foreign, in, foreign experience to that extent, but I have common sense, yeah. okay? And I'd use common sense right. in order to make certain that yeah. I represented the state of Do you have any Ukraine. reason to doubt the bipartisan report of the U.S. Senate that said that the Russians had interfered or attempted not to at interfere all. in the elections of 2016? I mean, and, and the reason yeah. is, it's because you had, uh, frankly, our, uh, national security, and we had uh, 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 upper echelon of our, our military that basically backed that up. Yeah. Um, would you be a vote in favor of election protections heading into 2020 if you were in the United States Senate right now? There doesn't even seem to be an appetite to consider those sorts of, le that sort of uh, legislation. What was your question? Election protections, laws to, to protect our elections heading into 2020 against some of the things that happened in election. Absolutely. Election. Yeah. Absolutely. And, we, and again, going back to funding, yeah. we, and from a priority standpoint, right. How important is that? And I think it's very important to most Americans. And so yeah. we've got to make certain that federal government, as well as state government, yeah. local government, do its part. On the question of elections, Senator, you've been pretty clear as well in the past, and you are clear on your campaign website about your commitment to voter protections, to um, making Election Day a national holiday, strengthening automatic voter registration, increasing the number of polling places, reversing what you say are discriminatory voter ID laws, voter suppression stuff. Why has Texas not moved more in the direction of an, I mean, we hear from our elected leaders in the state all the time how committed they are to democracy and giving people the opportunity to vote. But there are any number of things that we could be doing as a legislature, we could be doing in this country to enable more people to participate civically, regardless of how they participate, but we don't do them. So what do you do here? You're committed to all these things, but what could you, how could you actually move the needle on some of this? Staying at the table, advancing the arguments that we need to, advancing legislation to yeah. support these arguments and trying to encourage as many people as possible to participate. Yeah. Just like the issue, the gun issue. Yeah. All right? I mean, it was Ann Richardson myself, frankly. It, uh, Democrats and Republicans weren't supportive of the legislation. Yeah. But that didn't stop me from continuing to bring it up. Yeah. Okay? And I'll continue to bring up legislation that advance these particular issues. You believe we have a voter suppression problem in this country? Yes. And it, and it's voter ID is a part of it, you think? It is. What, el what else would be a part of it? Well, I mean, in terms of the issues concerning not having sufficient polling places, yeah. uh, having uh, long lines at polling places, those issues. Um, so that's just to name a few of them. And so from that vantage point, we've got to make certain 
that we have sufficient polling places, that we have, it, it makes no sense in Texas, and I argued this when the voter ID law was passed, why can't you use a student ID? You know? Yeah. And, and we're having more and more, you take, you take Purdue and m University down in Walla County, and it wasn't all of the county commissioner's fault. It was part of the Democratic Party's fault in terms of getting a polling place on a college campus. Yeah. Okay? Well, why not make it more convenient for people to be able to vote? And some of these things that we look at in terms of purging the rolls and then putting out uh, literature about if you don't do this and do that, you're scaring people off to vote. And you think this is a conscious decision on the part of the people who have their hands on I don't know whether it's conscious or not. I know the effect is discriminatory. Well, the effect is it's largely taking the, the vote out of the hands of people who not, over, not entirely but overwhelmingly might vote for one party. Well, it has a disparate impact. That's, that's the whole thing. Right. You know, and, and I'm yeah. not going to sit up and say that every person right. that voted for the bill yeah. uh, is, is, is discriminated, is bent towards being discriminated, right. discriminating against someone. Yeah. But the fact that the man it is has a disparate impact. Let me ask you, Senator, about race. What has happened over the last couple of years that we are having such an open and difficult and hostile conversation around race? I believe that we've been having this conversation to some degree for a very long time, but it's like the quiet part is now being said routinely out loud with no consequence. The, the president. You think you put it entirely at his feet? All right, let me, put it, let me put it this way. Yeah. The president of the United States is the most powerful position in the world. Right. That megaphone reverberates yep. around the world. When you have a president that says that Charlottesville, you had good people on both sides. Both sides. Of, both right. sides. Yep. That set the tone. Some of the things he said during his election, that kind of set the tone. And some of the things he said since then yep. set the tone. Concerning Jewish Americans, in, in terms of African Americans, Hispanics. When you have a president that talks about some of the countries in Africa in terms of them, you know what he said. Yep. That sets the tone. And then you end up having people say, well, the president is doing this. Hell, I can do it, too. And that's what's going on. So you on think he's letting the virus out of the test tube, effectively, right? I don't right? think he's letting it out. He you, is letting you know, it out. You think the president's racist? Do I think the president Do you think is, the president is a racist? You know, I wouldn't call him a racist. Some of the things that he's done have had racist impacts. Right. Now, you know there are people in your party who would say that that's not a really good answer. That that's, okay, that's fine. That, that's you're, the, you're dancing around that. Okay, that's fine. Do you think he's a racist? I'm not running for the Senate. Well, I'm just Senator asking you as, as a citizen of the state Senator, of Texas. Senator West, nice, as a citizen in the state of Texas. Nice, nice try. I'm not running for the Senate. You are, and people in your party would like to know a straight answer from well, you. Do you that, think the president's well, okay. racist? That's, that is my answer. That you don't, you don't believe he's racist? Uh, what I said, he's done some racist things. You think he's a white supremacist? Uh, yes, he's, he, he has definitely been towards white supremacy. Yeah. Do you, do you worry, as an African American running in Texas in 2019, that you would have a problem getting elected statewide? Do you believe that the state is open to the idea of electing an African American candidate statewide from the Democratic Party? We'll find out. Right. Okay, we'll but find out. But do you out. have any concerns about that? Any, sure. Uh, any this this is that? what's going to happen. Yeah. And I've said this, in fact, I said this at a at a, uh, an event down here in Austin. Yeah. Uh, there will be some people that will vote against me because of the color of my skin. Yeah. And there were people to be voting for me because of the color of my skin. Right. What I'm trying to do is to find people in Texas that we have a common interest. Right. And then go towards those persons and try to get. And you will support. campaign all over the state and ask for people's votes in places where Democrats typically go, and maybe perhaps to the 2018 campaign analogy where Democrats typically do not go. Absolutely. Going to every place. We asked a question before we open it up for a couple of questions from the audience. So we do have a presidential race that is kind of the wrapper around so many other elections on the ballot next time. Who is your candidate? I, I don't have a candidate. You have a point of view about the candidates in the race? I mean, you all, made all you indicated it. to me earlier you thought that a, quote, far-left candidate could not get elected can, in can Texas. Can I answer your question? Sure, of course. Okay. I think all of them are good people, okay? But I'm not tying uh, my senatorial uh, journey to one particular candidate. Yeah. Okay? Anybody you couldn't support? No. Even one of those so-called far-left candidates who you think can't win Texas, if that person's a nominee, you're going to support that person. What you sit up and said, is there anyone I couldn't support? And I said, the answer is no. Right. So whoever the nominee of the Democratic Party is at the state, at the presidential level, you will support and yes. you will campaign with that person. I didn't say all that. I said that. But I'm going to end up having my, my own campaign. If I'm the nominee for 
the U.S. Senate. Yeah. I'm going to run my race yeah. to win Texas <clears throat> right. as a U.S. Senator. Right. Okay. To the extent that the policies that the nominee has, the presidential nominee has, I'll be supportive of that. But I'm not going to be running to elect a U.S. A, a, a president. Right. I'm going to be running right. to become the U.S. Senator for the state of but Texas. But you acknowledge, though, that the presidential race, to the degree that it drives enthusiasm and turnout in Texas, which is going beneficial. to, which is going to I mean, look, if, if Dirk and, Nowitzki and, vice, and Jose and Altuve is the ticket, then that's one potential scenario. And vice versa. Right. I mean, the, the reality is, is that whoever the presidential nominee is, they will need my support here as the nominee for the U.S. Senate. So they should be concerned about who wins the Senate race. You shouldn't just be concerned about who wins the presidential race. Absolutely. Right. Um, is there a candidate who ultimately creates more opportunity for you in the Senate race if that person is the nominee versus another, even though you're going to support everybody? I'm just trying to understand what lane you're, no, you're in trying, You're trying to get me to answer that particular question. I, I am. And, I and, and the reality is that I've said what I'm going to say. Right. Uh, I am going to be running my own race yep. as for United States Senate. Right. That's what I'm going to be doing. At, right. And so in terms of what presidential candidate it is and all that stuff, uh, we have good people in the race. Yeah. And to the extent that Texans and the Democratic Party believes that one of those candidates right. should emerge, then so, so I, be it. I will see you campaigning in East Texas with Marianne Williamson then during the... No, we, no, you won't, okay? <laughs> uh, but you may see me in Fredericksburg. Okay. Um, we got about 10 minutes for questions. Let's ask the audience to get in. Mr. Richards, right here. Microphone for him. Sir. Thanks very much for coming. My uh, pleasure. I've, I've enjoyed listening to you. Um, there's a growing consensus that uh, one of the primary threats to civilization is climate change. Exactly. And there is now finally a Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. Exactly. That is now up to eight members. Right. How rapidly would you join that caucus, and how would you go about finding a Republican to join with you? Well, a very good question, because I didn't get a chance to talk about climate change. You know, I have... Been able, there's two bills in the House uh, that deals with climate change that, frankly, the one, there's one that deals with the carbon dividend piece that's very supported by members of the organizations that are here. I think it's the Citizens Climate Right, okay? And it has like 400 chapters across the entire country. I'm very supportive of that, okay? Because what it does, and I'm gonna answer your question, what it does, it brings market forces to bear persons in the fossil fuel industry with persons in the environmental industry. And you've got to have that connection in order to uh, uh, solve that problem. And I think that the structure that's been set up by, I think, uh, Senator Brom and Coons in the Senate is a perfect structure. Because if you can't get it out of that particular or organization, that particular caucus, which would require a unanimous consent, then it's not going to pass the Senate. And so from that vantage point, you got to make certain that uh, if you, the question you asked, would I, would I join that caucus? Yes, I would, because it's something that we have to deal with in this country, climate change. And we see it all over the world. I thought it was um, uh, foolhardy for the president to drop out of the Paris Accord. I mean, you've got to have these countries working together, and we can see the impact of uh, climate change. But the reality is, is that when we get, get, begin to look at Texas, we understand that Texas is probably the leading state in terms of energy. Uh, in the United States, and the prediction is is that you look at the permanent based and area and all of that, it's going to be one of the top producers of oil, I think, oil and maybe gas in the future. So we've got to have those persons at the table to resolve it. I would, in fact, join that call. Mr. Walters. Senator West, you are only the second black person since Reconstruction to run for U.S. Senate in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, some people would say that it's a financial you no know, issue as far as just having the money to run. Other folks would say that there is a significant um, civic education gap between uh, black students and other students in the state. Is there anything that you can see that we might be able to do to address that gap? Well, uh, very good, very good question because it's one of the things I'm going to do this morning when I leave here, I'm going over to the State Board of Education, okay? And there's an issue over there concerning African-American studies in the state, okay? I'm going to be there and, number one, applaud the State Board of Education for taking it up and uh, working with them in order to make certain that it's passed and properly implemented. And I think if you do that, you, what you end up doing is providing all students in this, in this state with not just the... Um, issue of slavery, not the issue of uh, 
uh, the peanut and things of that, but look at the contributions that have been made by African Americans throughout this entire state for the benefit of this state. Yeah. I think it's very important. Why, why have there not been more African American candidates running statewide? I think, I think the questioner makes a good point. We're talking but, about Ron Kirk was the last one to run for the Texas I mean, United it, States Senate in 2002. The, the, I mean, the reality <laughs> is, is that to, to run, it's an extraordinary amount of money that you have to put in every day. You have to be on the telephone calling people, trying to raise money every right. day. I, I leave here today. Uh, one of the things I've got to do is have a, two fundraisers today right. in order to try to raise the money in order to do it. What will but it I'm cost not, to I'm run this done race? I'm yeah. not done. Right. I'm not done. The reality is, is that someone has to do it. All right? right. And, the re and I'm in a position as an attorney to be able to do it, and I'm going to do it to the best that I can. What's it going to cost you to run this race? How much do you need to raise to run this race competitively? Well, let's see. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. You're talking about in terms of primary and general election. This is going to probably be a 25, 30 million at, at, at least race. Dollar race, right. right. Senator Cornyn will have resources for sure. Exactly. Ma'am. Good morning, right. Senator West. Good morning. I wanted to ask two questions, if that's okay. Sure. One, what is it like to run against? You have an, in the field probably the most experience in politics, and so you have a record. And you have other people that are running that don't necessarily have that same level of experience. Um, and so what is it like to run in this field, um, and how do you distinguish yourself in that regard? And then my second question is related to black women, and particularly black women in the Democratic Party. We're the base of the party. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so how do how does your campaign and then potentially your being in the Senate address black women great, and their great issues? Uh, as it relates to, let me, the last one first. When you begin to look at my support base, you'll see African-American women involved in my race, elected officials and also in the community. When you begin to look at the first question, um, which was, what was the first question? It was about the, how do you run in the, you're maybe the most experienced, okay. but and you're running against it, some people who have what, no experience. What ends right. up happening, it kind of depends upon what part of the state I'm in. To the extent that I'm in a state, a part of the state where I have an elected official that's supportive of me, I end up having that person speak for me and tell people about me before I go in and try to uh, introduce myself. But you know, the momentum in the party, again, thinking about the current political environment, not having experience is actually a badge of honor in some places. There's a sense that people who've been in office for a long time, and you've been in the Senate for 26 years, have been there too long, that it's time to actually overthrow the existing order and let's put some new people into office. You yourself talk about term limiting if you go into the U.S. Senate. Are you sympathetic to that point of view in a race in which you've got some people running who don't have experience and they're actually advertising that as a positive? Well, I mean, you've got to have new blood in, in, come into the system. Right. Uh, this past weekend, I was a, a lecturer in Dallas at a, a leadership academy yep. where new candidates want to come into the yep. system. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I, no, I'm not, I think that we should be doing that. I have an internship program, uh, right. Evan, that's been around for 26 years where we've been training leaders. Right. And now we have some of those same kids that we had uh, in the in college internship program that we got jobs for. They're now working, and some of them now are elected officials. But exper so experience is not a liability. It's just that there's, a, there's room for people who don't have experience. We need people who don't have experience to Absolutely. get in. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's stop it there so the senator can move on with his day and you all can move on with yours. Please give him a big hand. Thank him for being here. We'll see you again. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, sir. My pleasure.